This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 59. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. First off, before we get started, let's talk about our sponsor, Kimber Firearms. Kimber was founded with the singular purpose of making every firearm the best it can possibly be with a fit and finish that only practiced hands can achieve and appreciate. Whether you carry a Kimber for personal protection, hunting, or competition, know that their promise of quality without compromise is how they measure success. To learn more about Kimber Firearms, visit KimberAmerica.com. Well, Bobby Tyler of Tyler Gunworks in Friona, Texas, is a world-class pistol artist. Currently one of the hottest names in the business, Bobby and his incredible team take customers' guns, both revolvers and auto pistols, and then turn them into one-of-a-kind keepsakes. Not ironically, I happen to be one of those happy customers. Bobby's a wealth of information on the subject, and he also knows value is a critical piece of the puzzle, whether you just want your gun tuned or given the full measure of cosmetic touches. He's also one of the industry's leading experts on color case hardening, and we even talk about choosing the leather for your new masterpiece. Now here's my chat with Bobby Tyler on how to get started on the road to your own custom pistol. Good morning, Bobby. How is it in West Texas? We are doing well and beautiful day coming up here today. Well, that's good to know because we had our first snow here in the Midwest and uh, I've been out shoveling driveways. So it was nice to get in and get some dry clothes on and, and have a chat with you this morning. Well, I've been looking forward to it. Well, if folks don't know who you are, um, Bobby Tyler, Tyler Gun Works. You are a, uh, I don't know what you call yourself. I call you a custom uh pistol smith uh even though you don't necessarily build pistols from scratch but you take uh pistols that customers bring to you and you do all kinds of really cool stuff and i just had a uh, a gun done myself actually a pair of guns for myself and a, a good friend and uh it turned out wonderful so we were talking about the idea of having custom pistols done and i would have to say you're probably one of the top names in the business in the country right now well thank you uh, so I guess I'll start off by saying I may fall into that jack of all trades category in this department. Uh, we try to be a one-stop shop and, and cover all the bases. Yep. Um, we are a finish company. We do uh, color case finish for about 42 different manufacturers throughout oh, the United States. I didn't know that. And so our main thing that we do is color case. Uh, ah. You know, here, here we are, what, about 10 o'clock this morning here. And we've probably already ran close to a hundred Henry receivers this morning. Oh wow! Okay. So there's so there's 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 a couple of different divisions of us. So okay. basically, in the mornings we get up, we run hard, we run our color case. Uh, kind of after lunch, we start in kind of in our custom shop. As you know, and everybody else that's listening, you're only as good as the help you surround yourself with. Yep. Boy, do I have some good help. Well, your product certainly shows that. So I, I definitely want to talk on the color case, uh, but let's let's start with this whole custom pistol idea first. I have never had a, a custom firearm, and when I got these uh, sequentially numbered Ruger Vaqueros, one for my myself and my friend, and we wanted you know something special to kind of commemorate our friendship and the uh, all the trouble we've gotten into over the years. So when we were talking, your name came up, Tyler Gunworks. You're the guy, and oh my goodness, they they came back even better than I expected. You know, I, I'm so excited. But that kind of brings us to the topic of the day, which is. Uh, why should somebody even consider having a custom gun? I mean, I know why I did, but talking to people like you do every day, why would somebody even want to do that? Well, so so let's just talk about a, a stock Ruger. It's a production gun. It's a fine, fine gun. There's probably not a better base gun or a better revolver for the money on the market. Well, that's good to know. Uh, so So here's the deal, though. They build guns for a living production so it's got production features uh i'm not throwing rocks at it but it is what it is right and so you know when you wake up one morning and you decide i want a custom gun 
you you want something that's better than the bar. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things I tell my guys every day, if you can't cock the hammer and it put a smile on your face every single time, either I did something wrong or we did something wrong as a team. I, I like so, that. I'm going to steal that. I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, just cocking the action on these once we get them worked, it just flat puts a grin on your face yeah. and it does mine every time. So, so one of the things you want to keep in mind is, you know, get a plan. Yeah. And sometimes you can't get that plan until we get on the phone, which we do. We still take the time. I take all my own calls and I will talk to you guys and say, Hey, what's on your mind, what's on your heart and what's your end goal. Cause if you'll tell me what the end goal is, Usually I can fill in the pieces in between, you know, you say, Hey, I want to, you know, an Elmer Keith type or a Skeeter skeleton type, or I want to, you know, six and a half inch barrel. I don't know what kind of sight I'll say, well, are you going to shoot 25 yards plus, or are you shooting close range or, you know, that just sends us in directions on yeah. what kind of sights we use, um, what kind of grips we use. If the finish work and stuff, it works itself out pretty easy because we either go engraving or we don't, or we do bluing, or if it's stainless, we ink it. I mean, there's just a few things that are pretty standard, but then other than that, it's just almost like Burger King. <laughs> so you really do get to have it your way. Well, I, I got to say on, on my project, um, we knew we wanted to do something special, but we didn't know exactly what. And and I was so afraid when we started talking to you, you'd be like, come on, you, you, give me an idea here. And you walked us through this, you know, the best way to do what we wanted to do, which is in our case, we didn't want safe queens. We wanted guns that we can actually carry. And, you know, my goal is when we were both sitting on the, the front porch of the, the old folks home, we've got these tooth scarred revolvers and, you know, we can tell lies about charging up Chapultepec and, you know, killing the grizzly <laughs> at, at four feet and all that kind of stuff. So they're beautiful and they're incredible, but they're they're kind of working pieces. And the cool thing is you kind of talked us through some ways to make them unique and individual with some special engraving and our initials and things like that. But they don't look like something that should just live in the safe. And it was really cool to talk to you. And you, you mentioned talking to customers bef as we got on this call. You were actually talking to another customer and walking them through that process. So do you start with just that question of, you know, what are you going to use it for and where do you go from there? Well, I definitely keep in mind that I have two ears and one mouth <laughs> and the customer will usually put you on the right track and kind of start guiding you. But with that being said, you know, I always tell people, I'll say, Hey, what do you do for a living? You know? And, uh, for instance, when the guy said, I'm a, you know, I'm in major construction, like high rise type construction. I said, well, one thing that I would never do is call you and tell you how to build a high rise. <laughs> yeah. And I said, you called me for a reason, uh, whether it be cause you wanted you know, our product, you wanted our product and our customer service, uh, whatever it is that the reason why you picked us, let me do my job, but let me, you know, let me do it so that it, so that it guides and helps you. Yeah. So you've got to listen. And then once a customer starts sending you in a direction, you get to a point where you can, you can say, okay, well, what about this? Cause I know the things that get mixed up in the middle and me being able to go in and eliminate those things makes it to where it's not just a custom gun, but every time they see it, every time they cock that hammer, get that smile on their face, they're also going to think, you know what? This wasn't like going to 15 dealerships, buying a new car yeah. and talking to 15 car salesmen and then filling paperwork out twice. This was a smooth sailing experience and it was, it was what it should have been. And that's our goal. And that's how it, how it worked for me. What are some of the common things that you do to almost all of them? And when somebody's considering this process, some of the stuff that it's kind of a, a almost a given, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Well, so one of the things that, that I tell a customer, and sometimes it may be misunderstood, but uh, I still say it anyway, because it's important to me and I talk from the heart, but I tell them, so we're going to get started on this project. The first thing we're going to do is the action job. 
And if you don't want to take time to do the action job, you've, you've got the wrong number. Yeah. So there it is. I mean, if, if you don't take time to make the gun look good on the outside, but feel good on the inside, but still shoot with anything out on the market, then we've missed the boat here. Good point. So you can't just have a pretty, I mean, we build pretty guns. That's what we have a reputation for. Yeah. But they can't just be a pretty gun. They <laughs> have to be something that you could go toe to toe at any time, day or night, and use functionally because it's still a tool. Well, I got to say on mine, it, it's like a bank vault. I mean, the cylinder gap is almost non-existent. The the trigger, the, just everything about the gun. You've, and again, Ruger makes a great gun. It's a production gun, but the difference before versus after, it, it's I, I've heard it called. It's like closing a Chubb safe. You know, it just that clang, and it, then it's locked up. Yeah, the timing. So yeah. when we do our action job, we go in, we set the trigger pull at a certain weight. Uh, and a lot of that's just discussed with the customer. Are you going to be hunting? Are you shooting? What's your skill level? Uh, you know, there's, there's questions. And, uh, and w when we establish that, we set the trigger pull. We do the action. But also, we go in and we set the timing. And sometimes that means going in, re restructuring where the hand sets, restructuring where the bolt sets, the timing on which it locks up. I mean, all that stuff has to happen like a perfect mechanical device. Mm -hmm. And when you get one where it all works right, two things happen. It no longer beats itself up during use, which makes it last forever. It'll outlast you. Good point. The other thing is, is it makes it to where it works in conjunction with everything else, and it makes your overall shooting experience better. There's nothing worse than going to the range and shooting something where you know in the back of your mind it's just not quite working right and we've all done it yeah definitely. And you think oh, i am shooting but it's just off a little we've talked about action jobs on almost everything beyond that what what where do you go from the action job so let's back up on, on one more topic first the okay. first discussion is are we going blue or stainless ah because that separates two different entities um if it's a stainless gun, which I, I hate to tell people this, stainless guns get in and out quicker because mm -hmm. they don't require finish. So if we do a stainless gun, it has its way, it works through, and it works right through. If we're doing a carbon steel gun, then we do just that. We go in and say, well, are we going to do the color case package? Are we going to do bluing? Are we going to do a combination of both? And I'm going to say nine times out of ten, if they've looked me up, they're calling, they go with the color case. Yeah. We have the barrel off for God's sake, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's the part when you have the barrel, you have to remove the barrel. You have to, I mean, everything comes down to pins and springs here. Right. And when you have that barrel off, it's time to color case it. Makes sense. So, um, you know, and another, another topic is say it is stainless. Almost all of the hammers and triggers these days are stainless. We do color case those. Um, there's times where we'll color case uh, the receiver itself, but stainless steel can be colored, which is contrary to common belief, but it is not as bright and vibrant and attractive as carbon steel color case. And so I do it on hammers and triggers. We do it on, I mean, we do it on North American arms. We do it on bond arms. We've done it on, We've done it on a jillion different smaller type stainless, but yeah. the bigger the piece, the less consistency. That's why we can pull it off on hammers and triggers. And just like the one you have there, think, envision that gun with bright stainless hammer and trigger with what all we did. It just misses the boat. You know, it's funny you say it because I swore it had a stainless hammer, but it's it's beautifully color case hardened now. So we can, we, we developed a process about four years ago and we figured out a way to actually color case stainless. Yeah. So that was something that was a, a monumental place there for us in the gun industry. Very cool. The most obvious feature, though, uh, and the one that everybody always thinks of when we're talking custom guns, is the engraving. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how that works and some of the people that do that and, and just what you can tell a customer when you're discussing the level of engraving that you want. Let's do that. So I'll have people call and they'll say, 
So is this A, B, or C engraving? And I'll say, let's change this conversation. Let's talk about it like real people. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the deal. Engraving over the years has gotten to a place where people think, well, I can't afford engraving. Right. Um, engraving is unaffordable, and I don't know where to send it, and it'll be gone for two years, and blah, blah, blah. So what we did is we came in and we found a group of talented individuals that we either found that were in some sort of engraving industry. We just transitioned and we started to work with them in different ways. And right now we've got three guys cutting full time for us mm. and they come in, we sit down, we hold the project, they hold it, I hold it, we talk Sometimes a Sharpie's involved. Uh, I'm not very artistic. And so sometimes I'll take the Sharpie and I'll draw the area that I want covered and I'll draw, you know, corners, triangle, you know, things that I want. And then obviously they take, they design the art. And the one thing you don't ever want to do is put an artist in a bottle. Ah. Because you will never get it back. <laughs> so I, I, as a, as a, uh, as a businessman, as a contractor, as a employer of engravers, I do not say put this pattern on this gun. I took a different approach and I say, this is what our inspiration is. This is what our budget is. And so put all you can on this gun for this customer within this budget, because this is our budget. So people say, well, how do you establish that? Well, if you're calling me, sometimes you just got to trust me that <laughs> I'm going to make sure that the balance, the design, the style is right and it works with the finish. If it's color cased, it's got a, you don't want to pay to have a gun engraved, then pay to have one color cased and then fight each other. Yeah. And so there has to be some, they have to work together. Yep. And it's designed to work together in the layout of the art. Hit that point. I mean, you, you already hit it, but let's go more in depth because that's the question. I mean, everybody, everybody's a price shopper. I don't care if, <laughs> where you at or, or at in life. Everybody's kind of got a budget in mind. And I would say a lot of guys were like me that I can't really afford this. And it turns out it's not, you're not going to drop $25,000 on a handgun. You certainly could, I'm sure. But it's it's nothing like that. So the average guy could come into me and I, I catch a little whiplash on this from time to time from engravers that that take their own commissions <laughs> they take that two years they do this they'll say well you're you're tarnishing the engraving deal and i say wow. you know what I, i'm just doing my thing yeah and i have a clientele basis you have a clientele basis i do finish work for some of those guys because most of those guys don't do both yeah we like to be one stop we do the assembly disassembly we do the action we do the cut the barrel down, set the ejector rod housing back, put a new front side on, go to engraving, go to grips, go to finish, the whole nine yards. So what I tell them is I say, we've got to go in and establish. So for instance, a guy brings me in a Ruger Blackhawk and he says, okay, so we're going through our work order and we get to the point we've checked off action work. We've checked off accuracy package. We've checked off grips. We've established whether we wanted wood, mammoth ivory, stag, whatever we wanted. We get to the part where it says engraving and I say, what is your budget? How much can you spend on engraving? And some people say, well, what do you recommend? And I'll say, well, for the amount of coverage that I think we should put on this to get to the end result project, I think we should put $750 worth of coverage on there. That's my number for this gun, the way I've got it laid out. And realistically, if you sent that off to one of the guys that we've discussed, you're probably looking at about a $1,500 engraving job. Wow. But my guy just cut seven guns where this guy cut one and a little mathematics goes a long ways. <laughs> exactly. So, so you can look at it two different ways. It's not, we're not cheapening the product. Uh, so, so some of the difference in coverage is not in the amount of coverage on the gun. Some of it is in the shading, in the dig out, uh -huh. in the backgrounding. And so there are places where you can influence a budget in, in the way you background it and the way you shade it. 
that affects the budget tremendously, but doesn't affect the outlook of the gun or the amount of coverage. Very Does cool. that make sense? Absolutely. So let, let's get off onto this case hardening. Uh, I didn't realize that's how big you were. Uh, I knew you did some uh, uh, work for manufacturers, but uh, you do a lot of work for manufacturers. What? Uh, how did you even get started doing color case hardening? Because that, that seems like such a, a, an esoteric art, if I may say. How did right. that happen? Well, I decided one day, not long after I got married, I, you know, all great things come from a way, you know, and, and the one thing that I don't ever like to ever wake up and say is, why doesn't somebody do this? <laughs> because I'm that guy that I'm going to make it happen. Right. And so I decided to redo a, a, uh, a Ruger Vaquero old model that was somewhat sentimental to me. And I thought, I'm going to do this. So I got everything ready, prepped it, did this, did that, had everything done, and got down to needing to have the receiver color case hardened. And so I thought, well, I'm going to reach out, find somebody that does it. I'll have it done. I'll have it back here and be done. So here I am, a freshly married guy, uh, work boots on every day, you know, two hands, pull them on, go to work. Yep. Uh, the budget was not quite as good as the work <laughs> ethic, though. And so... I made some calls and everywhere I called, uh, I either hit a dead end due to not wanting to take my one piece or not wanting to not being able to afford it. Yeah. And so I said, why doesn't somebody do this affordable to where people could send this in and it's got to be a half of what everybody else is charging, you know? And yeah. so I started researching and researching and researching and I found a gentleman up in Montana that had been doing all the Browning, Winchester, a lot of some production, commercial work. And he had hit a health place in life with a brain tumor, I believe it was, oh. that he survived. And I called him and I said, hey, I want to do this. And he said, research it and call me back someday. And just, <laughs> really, just basically hung up the phone. So I researched it. I called him back and he said, uh, you know, and we went through about three steps of him making sure that I was committed. Yes. And he said, okay. He said, here's what you do. You get in your pickup and you drive to Montana. You bring this amount of money with you and I'll see you in four days. Wow. And so here I show up in Montana, this exact amount of money, everything just like what we planned and super good guy. Great man. I know his family. We do Christmas cards. He's still, he's still alive. He refers everything to me that came his way. Excellent. So basically what we took, we took his system in which they did some volume and we improved on it about 10 times uh, volume wise. Uh -huh. um, some quality differences uh, and obviously customer service. Um, they did not have email. Everything was handwritten correspondence. <laughs> uh, they didn't take phone calls. Oh, wow. Uh, they took some, but it was a, you almost had to write a letter. Yeah, it was an old school shop. It really was. And so, uh, obviously, we've been very blessed to have, uh, you know, once, once somebody writes something about what you do, it makes a difference too. People read it, they believe it. Yep. Be that good or be that bad. They read it, they believe it, and there we are. And our customers, we make them happy no matter what, you know, the, what separates the good, the good people from the bad people is how you handle the, the bad situations, not the good ones. Exactly. Anybody can handle those. And so, uh, you know, we just make sure that the end experience with our customers is pleasant no matter what. And so with the customer service part of it, that's how we grew the business leaps and bounds. So here I was driving back from Montana and I talked to my wife and I said, I'm, I've, I've got this. We've, we've got this. I'll be set up and I'm going <laughs> to run this thing when I get home. I'm going to unload it tonight in the middle of the night and I'm going to set everything up and I'm going to get started sampling pieces and I can do this. And uh, so I was driving along there and I thought, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to just call up uh, President Henry and just oh, wow. I'm just going to see if they need, you know, I, I'm just that guy that you got to ask. Yeah. So I called him up, got a hold somebody, got an email, got, you know, just started working through deals. 
And by the time I got home, I had correspondents already back, and they said, you know what? We are wanting to set up a product line just like what you're asking. Oh, wow. This is something we're actively been looking for. And I said, send samples. I'll do free samples. I'll send them back to you. And about five years, six years later, we were just hitting it on. You know, we're we're on we're running on ten cylinders right now. Wow, outstanding! So it's a it's a kind of the true American dream thing for me because we started this business with about seven hundred and fifty dollars that I got out of a Smith and Wesson Model Twenty Eight that I sold, deposited <laughs> in the bank, and we built a little sixteen by twelve wooden building. And uh, I caught that thing on fire thirteen times before I was able to afford to build a. <laughs> 30 by 40, which was our forever building that we outgrew a couple of years ago. And yeah. now, now we're in a pretty large facility. And we've got a lot of room. Well, for a uh, complete noob like me, I know case hardening involves uh, bone charcoal and dark arts. No, really, what 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 is it? I mean, or not, what is it? How does it work? This, this is a good time to go into this because I get calls all the time and people will say, so is this the chemical method or this, is this this? So myth, myth, myth. Yeah. So there's there's a company that about what 15 years ago did a chemical version. We're all still paying the consequences. <laughs> they they still pay the consequences. They hear about it all the time. They're one of our good companies that we all adore. It was potentially a mistake, but anyway, there's no such thing as that anymore. Ah. So so there's two methods that we use. We either use a bone charcoal or we use another method that has several different compounds in it. One of those compounds being cyanide. Oh, wow. So what happens is uh, they both go in a furnace. They both come out. They both go in a quench. Um, the bone and charcoal is slower. Each piece is packed differently. The the ones that go in the cyanide-based uh, compound, which there's other compounds in there too, a lot more to it it's not just you know but people say well you just spray the stuff on no it, it physically goes down into a furnace a visualize uh you're, you're in this room that has nothing but a furnace has all your your receivers going in production it's got all this uh equipment tied into it for monitoring temperature monitoring time monitoring all this each piece goes in exact amount of time exact temperature comes out goes into quench Another another batch goes in, and you've got a, a a person sitting there physically running every single piece that comes in and out of there. Wow! And so people will say, "Hey, that's a that's a chemical finish," and I get it every day. It's it's not that spray on chemical finish. It's production color case, yeah. which what we decide what gets uh, the bone and charcoal or what gets uh, the other compound base is whether it's preheat treated steel, if it's previously been done. We basically take the uh, the the base of the steel and we decide which process it gets based on what's the smartest, the safest, and better for the customer, which most of your steel of today, they don't need rehardening. Right. The manufacturers, the engineers, the people that, that do this for a living, they don't need that. And so if we're shooting for a cosmetic, we go in with the cyanide-based uh, finish. We keep it under a certain temperature. That way, we're not rehardening it, and we still get the cosmetic look that we're trying to achieve. Explain to me what the care and feeding of color case hardening, and I guess backing up prior to that. So it it's a surface treatment, but it's it's the steel itself. Are we depositing something on the steel? Are we changing the molecular structure on the surface, or Basically, what is case hardening? And then uh, part B of that question is, what do I need to do to keep my gun looking great? Okay, well, so you need to know what breaks it down. You need to know what protects it, and you need to know a little bit more about our process. So what's happening there is a carbon reaction. So the carbon is what does it in, in with all the compounds. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little more complex than just going in and saying, this is exactly what does it and breaks it down to make a long story short. Uh, when you come out of the furnace and you go into the quench, it's really unique to see 
it, it's it's actually it's one of those things that almost every time you're like wow <laughs> i mean it, it just never goes away so you put in silver prepped fully you know fully prepped and finished parts and you put them in the furnace when they come out uh, they're they're uh, almost cherry you know depending on like i said depending on if we're hardening it if we're down you know having to stay below that 1200 degree mark if we're up doing uh changing and temperature and hardness but anyway just for for all practical purposes we're down below that 1200 mark we're just wanting to color case it not color case harden it ah. and so when you go in that quench you've got this beautiful piece of metal when you come out of that quench i mean immediately you have a masterpiece you have all the colors and the and the different dimensions and the different way the colors are layered in there and there is a little bit of right at that moment in the quench you have a little bit of control of pattern ah. you can go in and you can quench it in different patterns and and Im improvise or influence just a little bit you know it's still a, like a dna no two are the same yeah but at that point you can go in and, and do different techniques on quenching and influence some and that's one of the things that over the years we have we do certain receivers a certain quench and keep them symmetrical basically yeah keep them the same uh, and then you know for colts winchesters old 1876s 86s restorations we do we try to quench them in a way that makes them look as original as possible I don't know if we're just dancing around here or if that was what you were asking. <laughs> no, that, but, that was a, But get to the part B now is how do I have to take care of this? Okay, good question. So so we come out of the – we go in the furnace. We come out of the furnace. We go in the quench. We go out to, to a, a holding area. We do a triple rinse on them at that point. That way there's no residue. There's no – you know, water kills any of the, the small amount of cyanide residue that could be in there. The water kills that. Then it goes into triple rinse, and then it comes out of triple rinse, and it goes into a, a basically a high, high-pressure air. So it's blown off with air instead of being wiped off with a rag, completely dried. It goes in the building and goes to a sealing station. So people will say, well, don't you put big old lacquer on there? Don't you put that? And I say, well, you know, in four years from now, when that lacquer starts turning yellow and flaking off, yeah. You and you and I are going to get along real good that I did what I did because <laughs> yep. what we use is a nano sealer and it penetrates into the pores of the steel. And if you rub your finger on it, you can feel that seal. And we put three coats of that nano sealer onto it. That nano sealer offers a 650 hour salt rating, which oh. handles the, the skin and salt that you get out of handling it, but also UV protection. Huh. UV is the killer for really? color case. UV. Yep. So so you got grandpa's old Winchester rifle that was propped up in the bedroom. And through the window, one side of it is plum silver. Yeah. But you know what? The other side of that receiver has color on it. Guess what? UV. I, I wouldn't have guessed that. Open the lever on a lever action rifle and under there in the darkness beautiful color on a rifle made in 1886 i'll be darned. but guess what the sun did not get there so do i need to just keep it oiled and keep my uh my salty grime away from it and that's gonna and out of uv so go home uh enjoy it take it to the range there's not anything you can ever do to it that i can't fix but when you get done clean it put a black coat of oil on it put it up just like you would any other gun excellent well, that's um, what I'll be doing. There's there's some horror stories about uh, ultra ultrasonic cleaners. Oh, really? With, with color case, that goes back to that oops about 15 <laughs> years ago with the spray gun. Makes sense. Getting back to your custom work, is there anything that uh, customers sometimes want you to do, and you're just not comfortable doing it, or don't want to do it, or is there anything you just really try to steer folks away from? There is, and I, I'm just going to come right out and say it because, you know, and there are people out there doing it, but I'm going to be that guy, and I'm just going to lay it out for you. So we are doing a lot of bearcats. Ah. 
like super, super custom Bearcats. And one of the things we do is we do a Bearcat conversion to 22 Magnum. Uh huh. So everybody calls and says, I want a 327 Bearcat. Yeah. Well, guess what? <laughs> I built one. I built it for myself. We did it as a tester gun. And the thing that we did that I think some of the other builders are not doing is I physically decided to test it. And when I hit 160 rounds, I cracked the frame. Oh. And so the Bearcat was designed by Ruger's engineers. They did not design that to handle the pressures of a 327. Yeah. And then here's the other thing. You got to go in and open that window a little bit more. It's not something that I condone. It's not something that I will do. It's not something I even discuss. Yeah. Because it's something that someday, you know, and I was shooting federal factory loads, but I physically cracked the frame myself. <laughs> Well, it could have been worse, so it was good you discovered that. Yeah, so we do not do uh, – we're, we're actually looking at right now doing a 25, like a 25 auto, like a rim, you really? know. We're thinking of, of experimenting and seeing what it would do to put one in there just for the fun of it. Sure. But 32s – and people say, well, the 32 is going to work because it's lesser pressure. Yes, that's correct. It is lesser pressure. You're still going in. You're still opening that window of that frame. You're still doing some things that realistically engineer wise shouldn't be done to it. Yeah. And so there we are. That that's one of the things that I will not do at all. So what about cosmetically? Is there stuff that just makes your skin crawl when somebody says, I want this? Or do you just say, Well, I I don't necessarily agree, but it's your gun. Yeah. Well, Every once in a while, a guy will call and say, hey, I want you to color case my receiver. I want you to blue all the small parts. I want this and that. And I want you to jewel my hammer. Ah. Uh. Well, I'm not a big fan of jeweling. Uh, I have a jeweling jig. And if after the customer and I get done with a discussion on it and I let them know what I think it does to the entire project and the product, you know what? It's still their custom gun. Yeah. And if they want jeweling on it, we'll put jeweling on it. But I sure try my best to talk them out of it. <laughs> it's just not my thing. And yeah. I have reasons why it's not my thing. And I share that. And a lot of times people say, you know, you're right. That really does take away from the overall project. Instead of you looking at the the custom crown, unless you, you know, you're looking at the grips, what you're doing is you're looking at it and bam, this, this hammer jumps out at you and you're like, oof. Yeah. You know, maybe we should have blended it all and made it to where it all works as one piece of art instead of making a highlight it's like you know having the where's waldo picture where you find waldo <laughs> and then all you see is waldo exactly so you've been doing this a long time you're as i said one of the most noted uh, custom gun builders in the country what what do you see this whole uh industry of, of customized guns where do you see it going or do you think we've reached a a, a peak in terms of technology and, and technique I think that's a great question. So I'll have people ask from time to time, is this a fad? And I'll say, yes, but luckily it's been going on since the late 1700s. <laughs> Good point. Good point. So I think we're, we're, you know, as you know, we're in a place politically mm. where there's some uncertainty. There's been a lot of spending and buying of black guns, ammunition, ammunition for black guns. I think what we're going to see as we climb out of this, bunker we've all been in here is you're going to see an increase in a rise in custom guns i think you're going to see people say you know i've got six glocks over here and i've got a you know nine ars over here but i need something to take my mind off things i want something because it's not just the gun you end up with it's the experience exactly you know the guy calls and i say okay well what barrel length do you want and then we have a discussion about why you want that barrel length you know, are you going to carry it in the woods? How about a little four inch barrel? How about a three and three quarter? Are you going to get all the velocity out of it? What cat, you know, so we go into all these different topics, but at the end of the day, I think we are technology wise, obviously we've got podcasts, we've got anything you want on the internet. Uh, people will call me and they'll know more about me than I do, <laughs> you know, Frightening. and I, yeah. Do your homework. Yeah. Um, do, do business with people 
It, you work hard for your money. I tell people this. You work hard. Everybody does. If you don't, you should. <laughs> but you work hard for your money. Spend your money where your heart is. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you hit a great point on experience. You know, that raises another question we talked about before we got started was you also talk to customers about uh, leather because that's a pretty important part of what's going on here. So one of the things I, I told you, I said, we've got engraving, we got grips, we got finish, we've got ac- action, we've got accuracy, and then we've got leather. So the last thing I want to do is finish this beautiful project out and then I sometimes lay in bed and have nightmares about people sticking it in an Uncle Mike's holster. <laughs> I knew that's I where really we were do. going. <laughs> I really, really yeah. do. You know, it's one of those things that sometimes I wake up and covered in sweat and think, <laughs> oh, surely that's not in an Uncle Mike's holster. Yeah. <laughs> but realistically, um, I'm going to say the same thing. You work hard. Make sure you, you spend your money where your heart is. Make sure it's people that are aligned with your morals, your beliefs, that if you call them and say, hey, I've got a problem with this. They're not going to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've already cashed your check. They're going to say, we no longer have a problem because you're my customer and I care. Yep. And so I, I pretty much just deal with two leather makers because there's not anything really in the market that I need that I can't get from one of those two places. And so a lot of times when it's in, I'll say, what do you need for leather? If you need leather, I'll help you. you know. And is it lined? Are we spending... $800 on finish work and you're going to stick this in an unlined holster. I mean, let's talk about this. Yeah. And so a lot of times I'll call and these two guys, they even got to where now they'll, they'll stamp our logo alongside their logo on the back of the holster. And it's just makes the whole project that much more personal and that much better and that yep. much nicer. And someday, uh, you know, we're not all going to live forever. And someday, that might add just a little bit more, a little more value, a little more sentimental value, a little more something to go on to either someone's kids or there's also the topic of, you know, some people don't all have kids. They want their guns and they're going to have another life someday. Yeah. And is that person going to be, you know, this guy did it right and he yeah. enjoyed it. He took care of it. It's not a safe queen. He used it. He carried it in good leather, comfortable leather. I mean, there's so, so I'm just going to say it. I, most of our leather is either done by Simply Rugged or Baranti leather. Yep. And I'm going to say most like 99.99%, you know, and I'll have people that'll send me a box full of leather and say, I want you to review this. I want you to use it in your pictures. I want you to, and <laughs> I, sometimes I'll open the box and I'll look in it and I'll shut the box Yeah. because you can tell by looking at the leather but there's times I'll take one and test it. I'll take a freshly blued gun, stick it in there 10 times, and I've already got distortion on metal finish. Uh. So if, you know, and I tell people, if you want a good product from a good person, call one of those guys. And then, you know, that's that's where that goes. I, I don't sell their product unless somebody says, I want this, I'll help them order it. But they're their own companies. They they have their own customer service and they're good. Well, I've got to say they're a lot like you that they completely stand behind everything and nothing gives them more heartburn than an un- unhappy customer. And we all know in this industry, that's not always the case. So you yeah, know, yeah, this is that, uh, you know, do, do one thing right. They tell one person, do one thing wrong. They tell 10, you know, it, it's just, it's just how it is. Yep. So, well, let's talk a little bit about cost. I did this gun or these pair of guns and I have absolutely zero intention of selling them. I hope my family will cherish them someday, but is, do you have people that have guns built just basically to, uh, for the trade? I do. So, so there's three categories. You've got the functional guy that just wants it super, super accurate, super functional. Uh, once the color case, once the blue no engraving, once the nice grips, that's that guy. Uh, and that guy knows what he wants, and we, we get it. We get it in and out. Then you get the guy who comes in, and he wants it pretty from front to back. He wants everything you can do to it. And then the third guy is I've got guys out there that buy them for investments. Mm. You show me a better place to put money than guns right now, <laughs> you know, realistically. No kidding. So I've got guys that will call and say, hey, uh, 
I saw on your website, you've got a Colt Series 70 Gold Cup national match, fully engraved, mammoth ivory, Snyder parts, everything you can do to one. And so the way we promote that and the way we went into that on all three categories is customer either buys a gun from me or they have their own gun. I don't care as long as it's not wore out on a base gun. Mm -hmm. And we've priced our prices to where when they get done with the project, they're not like the traditional old custom rifle where the day that guy paid for it is the most it'll ever be worth <laughs> because we've all been there. Yep. You're like, Oh, I just got my new model 70 built with this custom stock and I just paid $5,000 for it. And that's worth a thousand dollars. Oops. So we had to build in some equity for these guys. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've kept our prices to where, uh, and we keep meat on the bone because we're not the last stop. A lot of these go to dealers all, all over the United States and then they resell them again. Yeah. And so you have to have equity in what you're doing or how am I going to look you in the eye and say, this is a good investment. I think you should invest $10,000 with me and buy whatever it is. How do I look you in the eye and ask you to do that? If I know that it's tapped out when you get it and you're not going to make any investment. Exactly. So, uh, those are the three major, major categories. And in, in the engraving, the way we've designed the engraving, we talked about earlier, a lot of that equity is built into the engraving. Some of the, uh, some of that equity is built into the color case. The one place we can't build any equity is in the metal prep because time is time. My guys could be busy doing this or they could be busy doing this and it doesn't matter. It's still their time. They yep. still have families and they still get paid just like we all do. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, but now I've got to ask you the impossible question. Of okay. all the all the guns you've done, they're they're like snowflakes and they're like like no. your children. You got a favorite? Man, that is a rough one. Uh so I could probably narrow it down to a favorite Colt, a favorite Ruger, and a favorite Bearcat, but that would be, <laughs> and, I, and I will tell you that all three of those do have some engraving on them at some level. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I'm not, you know, guys will call and say, well, I, you can't shoot engraving. Well, of course you can't shoot engraving, but, you know, at the end of the day, you work hard. You pull your pants on, you pull your boots on. If you're able, if I can look at you and say, you know what, you can afford engraving. I'll make it where you can afford engraving. And if you can take that gun and do what you do with it and, and it look better, it's just something that, you know, you're, you're still a person. Yeah. You know, you still want, you know, everybody wants it the American way, the most they can get for the least amount of money. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's just a proven fact. That's just how it is. I'm that way. I go, I went the other day and bought something and I stood there and talked to them. And I said, is this the very best product that you have to offer? They said, yes. I said, well, what's the very cheapest you can sell it to me for? You know, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. I, I'm uh, conservative and I care about my money and I want my kids to be conservative and, and uh, I don't want to overpay. And so when I talk to a customer, whether they're from the guy that just called me a while ago was from Washington, I think. And, uh, you know, doesn't matter where it's at. I want him to have the same thing the guy in Arizona has. And I don't care about cost of living. I don't care about, you know, well, I've heard, well, this guy's from somewhere back East and got a big corporate job. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what he does. I just want to know that I treated him the best he could be treated within our little realm, you know? The way it should be. Well, if somebody is thinking about having a, uh, a gun given the full treatment, how can they find out more about Tyler Gunworks? Well, I, like I said, I do still answer my own calls. Uh, that is getting more difficult, you know, <laughs> and so if you call me and you don't get a call back that day, don't freak out because sometimes I'm on a call and I'll miss six. <laughs> and that adds up in a hurry. Yeah. So we have a website, tylergunworks.com. Um, after the first year, we're actually going to go through, uh, update a few things. We're going to make some changes, keep it fresh. It's a, it's a pretty fresh, nice website, but we're going to have a lot of information on there. But also there's email. You go through that system. You can even add pictures. 
and we will, I will get back to you. Excellent. Well, I, I cannot recommend you highly enough, both uh, as a company and as finished product. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm sitting here holding uh, my Ruger in my hand, and I can't wait. We haven't actually shot them. We were saving that till we were together. So we're going to have a special day. We're going to go out to the range and just just uh, turn some powder into noise, and it'll be a, a pretty cool thing. But like I said, you know, if, if folks think that ah, I can't afford a custom gun, why do I even need a custom gun? And until you've looked at a gun that is yours and you've done something special with it, you've had Bobby do something special with it, um, it's a feeling that's hard to describe. So I, I highly recommend any avid shooter at some point should talk to Tyler Gunworks. Bobby, uh, it was great talking to you in the Guns Magazine podcast. It's been a pleasure, and I'll look forward to that report, and you guys have a Merry Christmas. Well, it was great talking to Bobby Tyler, and as I mentioned, I can't say enough about the company and the quality of their work. If you happen to see me strutting around with a cool-looking Ruger single action on my hip, rest assured it was compliments of Tyler Gunworks. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Please tell all your friends, even those crazy liberals. Guns Magazine was first in the business, and we're using our decades of friendships to bring you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out on anything by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast catcher, YouTube, and, of course, at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our sister publication, American Handgunner Magazine, at AmericanHandgunner.com. Even better, strike a blow for free speech by subscribing to one or both of our great print magazines. And finally, I'd like to remind you to check out our sponsor and friend, Kimber Firearms, at KimberAmerica.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat, now get out there and get shooting. Get shooting.